This video is brought to you by Thrive Fantasy, proud partners of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Thrive is all about player props for the top tier athletes, so you don't have to spend countless hours of research on sleeper players. The more props you win, the more points you receive. Thrive has given away $4 million in cash prizes and has over $140,000 guaranteed in cash prizes for week one of the NFL season. Use the promo code JG9 when you sign up to receive a 100% instant first deposit match up to $100. Download the app or go to thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop up today. And now, on with our feature presentation. What's the quickest way to get into a coach's doghouse? What's the quickest way to bury yourself on the depth chart so badly to the point where the coaching staff will never have faith in you to do anything right? and to where the coaching staff will just flat out stop playing you. Not showing up to practice, doing something really stupid in a game, getting suspended for violating the league drug policy or something along those lines, all of those are very good answers. But we want something quicker. We want something that takes two seconds and can be done with just a few simple words. So with that in mind, allow me to introduce you to one of the stupidest things any player in the history of the Kansas City Chiefs has ever done, and quite possibly one of the stupidest things any player in the NFL has ever done. In 1988, Chiefs running back and former first-round pick Paul Palmer completely torpedoed his career with a comment to the coaching staff so bad and so out of line that it nearly single-handedly ended his career. This is the story behind the controversy, and behind how Palmer's once promising career came to an immediate end with just a few simple words. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context as to the player in question, and the events that led up to Palmer and the coaching staff going at it with the coaching staff reaching its breaking point and just suspending Palmer for conduct detrimental to the team. Our story begins in 1986, when there was one running back taking college football by storm. Now for the most part, Temple was a pretty easy team to ignore. They made it to just two bowl games in school history, with an appearance in the 1979 Garden State Bowl and the 1934 Sugar Bowl, and they routinely finished somewhere around 500. They also had some guy named Bruce Arians as their head coach throughout the 1980s. Wonder what he's up to now. However, in 1986, College football fans could not ignore Temple for one simple reason. They had Paul Palmer. Palmer was already a very solid player for the Owls over his first three seasons. In 1985, he had over 1,500 rushing yards, which led all independents and was the fourth highest total in the NCAA. But it was the 1986 season where he truly exploded onto the scene. For in 1986, there was no running back in the country more feared than Palmer. He finished the year with 1,866 rushing yards and over 5 yards per carry. This ranked first in the NCAA. He had 15 rushing touchdowns, which ranked 5th in the NCAA and 1st amongst all independents. He had 358 touches, which ranked 2nd in the NCAA, so you knew that if you turned on a Temple game that year, he was guaranteed to play a big part. And he had 1,976 yards from scrimmage, which was the best total in the entire NCAA. While Miami quarterback Vinny Testaverde ran away with the Heisman after his 26 touchdown season that had him as a lock to go 1st overall in the 1987 NFL Draft, Palmer came in 2nd place. He was a class above every running back in football that season, after one of the best individual seasons by any player in Temple history. We'll come back to his Temple career in a bit, because it does play a part in the story later on. However, entering the 1987 NFL Draft, everyone expected Palmer to be chosen early after that incredible 1986 season that he had. Here's just one of the many mock drafts from around this time that had him going in the first round. This one had him pegged to the San Francisco 49ers. And sure enough, the experts were right in terms of him being a first round pick as with the 19th pick, the Kansas City Chiefs chose the Temple back. The Chiefs had a very weak rushing game the year before, as in 1986, despite making it to the postseason, it was in spite of their running game, which did not cross the 100-yard mark over its final seven games, ranked second to last in rushing yards, and ranked third to last in yards per attempt. On paper, Palmer was going to be the man to fix all of that, and be the Chiefs' first true threat at the position since the gone-way-too-soon Joe Delaney. However, it wouldn't quite work out that way. At first, Chiefs fans had every reason to be thrilled with the play of Palmer. In the very first game against the San Diego Chargers, with the score tied at 13 apiece, Palmer went back for the kickoff late in the fourth quarter, and he took it 95 yards to the house for the game-winning touchdown. Kansas City won their opening game, taking it 20-13, and Palmer was the hero. Unfortunately, those chances would be few and far between, as he did not play a whole lot during that rookie season. While Palmer got his chance to return some kicks, and he did have another kickoff return touchdown at the end of the season against the Seahawks, he only ran 24 times. Despite his high 6.5 yards per carry average across that small sample size, he never found the end zone on offense. He was mainly used on special teams, and was losing reps to Christian Okoye and Herman Hurd. Okoye was drafted by the Chiefs in the second round that same year, and the Nigerian Nightmare's career turned out way better, to the point where he is a Chiefs legend. Palmer, on the other hand, yeah, not so much. 
I should note that during his rookie season, he was not in the right headspace. He had to deal with a lot when he was entering the league. His great-grandmother, who raised him ever since he was two years old, died the day he got drafted. Fortunately, she was around to see him get drafted, but this death weighed a huge toll on him. He had two kids on the way, lost 15 pounds that he wasn't supposed to lose, and dealt with all of this without getting any therapy. As he said on that rookie season, I was a mental mess. And unfortunately for him, it seemed like he wasn't going to be in the right headspace in 1988 either. That offseason, it was reported that Palmer was paid by an agent prior to his senior season at Temple, which led to lots of his records being removed and led Temple to forfeit their games from the 1986 season. And Palmer didn't take the news well at all. He was already disappointed about his lack of playing time in his spot on the depth chart, and now when you add this news on top of it, as Chief Staff member Jim Carr said, he wasn't a happy camper. The good news for Palmer in 1988 was that he would see an increase in playing time, and a substantial one at that. At one point during the season, he was near the top of the entire NFL in yards from scrimmage, and it was a neck-and-neck -neck battle between him and eventual Hall of Famer Eric Dickerson for the league lead in this category. The bad news was, well, there was a lot of bad news. The Chiefs were terrible, so their first 10 games, they only won once. Palmer was not a very effective runner, as even though he averaged 6.5 yards per carry in 1987, that dipped to half of that in 1988. And he had some fumbling issues. Over those first two seasons, on 215 touches, he fumbled it 9 times, which comes out to an average of once every 24 carries. That's pretty high. Still, he was getting playing time and was getting a chance to show what he could do. But around Thanksgiving, that would all change. Let's set the scene. It's November 26th, the night before the Kansas City Chiefs are scheduled to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers at Three Rivers Stadium. By this point, frustrations were at an all-time high. The team's season was over, and players and fans were coming to the realization that as great of a special teams coordinator as Frank Gans was, he was an awful head coach who was completely in over his head and made questionable decision after questionable decision. He also lied about practically everything he'd ever done in his career, which is kind of frowned upon. If you want to learn more about that and how he essentially Bishop sycamore his way into a head coaching job, then click the card in the upper right corner. Palmer didn't like Gans, as not only did he not think that he was a good head coach, but he was not happy with his usage. In Week 12 against the Seahawks, Palmer didn't touch the ball once. He had been held at 8 or fewer carries in 6 of the team's last 7 games, as by this point, Kansas City only really viewed him as a receiving back. And on that fateful Saturday, as the Chiefs were scheduled to hold the team meeting, some players showed up late. There are conflicting reports about Palmer's status at this meeting. Some reports say that he was not among the late players, while others say that he was one of 30 players to show up late. However, strength coach C.T. Hewley informed said players that they would be fine for showing up late. Which is when Palmer, with an earshot of Hewley on the team bus, said that he wouldn't mind dropping a few balls on the carpet if it meant that Gans would get fired. In other words, he wouldn't mind intentionally fumbling the ball just so that they could get some new leadership. Whether this was a joke or whether this was what Palmer actually believed, we don't truly know, even though Palmer insists it was just a joke. But Hewley heard those comments, reported them to Gans, and that night, Gans sent Palmer home and suspended him for conduct detrimental to the team. Apparently, it's against team rules to say that you're going to try and do your job poorly so that the coach gets fired. I know, crazy, right? As Gans said on the suspension, when asked if the violation involved the integrity of the game, he said, I believe that's the very essence of it. Gans later said, The suspension was totally my decision. I had no alternative. I received information Saturday night. I verified that information Saturday night. I had no choice. Just like that, what could have been a somewhat promising career with the Chiefs was completely torpedoed. The Chiefs lost to the Steelers 16-10 in a game played without Palmer. For those wondering, the Chiefs fumbled twice and lost one of those fumbles. So whether or not Palmer would have increased that total isn't entirely clear. And on Monday, when Palmer tried to get into the team facility, he couldn't get in. The suspension was indefinite, and theoretically, could have lasted for four weeks, which is the maximum length of a suspension for conduct detrimental to the team. As a side note, if you want to see an instance of a coach suspending a player for such conduct, and then the league stepping in and reversing the suspension because it had gone on for long enough, then click the card in the upper right corner. Fortunately for Palmer, the suspension would be short-lived, as on Tuesday, he was reinstated. Palmer apologized for the comments saying the statements that were made were out of frustration on my behalf. The season had kind of gone from one extreme to another, and I guess I just kind of got fed up and made a few statements that I shouldn't have about the coaching staff and their future being here. Gans was ready to move on, saying the incident that led to Palmer's suspension has been resolved, and we're very happy to have him back on the football team. However, as you can probably imagine, it wasn't easy for Palmer to get any playing time after this. Once near the top of the league in the conference in yards from scrimmage, he was now buried on the depth chart behind Okoye and Hurd 
just as he was back in 1987. Over the final three games, he had a mere 13 touches on offense. If you saw Palmer on the field during the month of December in 1988, it was likely as a kick returner, where he got the bulk of his work and average less than 16 yards per return, which is pretty poor, especially since he led the league in kick return touchdowns the year before and averaged over 24 yards per return that year. And even though Gans would be fired at the end of the 1988 season and would be replaced by Marty Schottenheimer, Palmer would also find himself on the outs. After the 1989 preseason, the Chiefs cut Palmer. This meant that the first-round pick played a grand total of two seasons and scored two rushing touchdowns. If you're drafting a running back in the first round and he finds the end zone just twice, you royally screwed up somewhere along the line. To be fair to Kansas City, in between Palmer and Okoye, four running backs were taken, and none of them did anything of note, unless names like Kenny Flowers, Roger Vick, and Terrence Flagler ring any bells to you. Palmer was signed by the Detroit Lions, who oddly enough, had Gans on their staff as their special teams coordinator, but he had no carries with them and was eventually traded to the Dallas Cowboys for a few picks. Maybe Palmer could revive his career with the Cowboys. Jimmy Johnson knew what he could do, as he was the head coach in Miami when Testaverde won the Heisman and Palmer came in second. Plus, the Cowboys had an opening at running back that they needed to fill after the Herschel Walker trade. However, Palmer was pretty pedestrian. In nine games with the team, he only found the end zone twice, and whereas he was a halfway decent receiving threat in Kansas City, he had less than 100 receiving yards on just 5.5 yards per reception with the Cowboys. Palmer never played in the NFL again after that 1989 season, and after two seasons in the World League of American Football with the Barcelona Dragons, was out of football by 1992, just five years after getting drafted inside the top 20. So what's the moral of the story? Words matter. And while I'm not going to say that Palmer was a good player, I am going to say that there is no way he is off the Chiefs after just two seasons if he didn't make that ill-advised statement. Whether it was a joke or a serious message, threatening to fumble just so that the coach gets fired is a horrible idea. It undermines the integrity of the game, it hurts your teammates and their trust in you, and will definitely make a coach not want to play you. It took Palmer years and years of hard work and sacrifice to make it to the NFL and build himself a career, and took him just one comment to ruin it all. Get your official Jaguar Gary 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jargator 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.